Good morning. Welcome to Stonehouse. Um, we are coming to you from Killarney, Manitoba today, and I'm just going to show you a picture of it'll it'll adjust and you'll be able to see our view outside. So here you are. You can see that. <laughs> this is where we are. It's too windy today to be outside, unfortunately. So I'm sitting at my in-laws kitchen table and this morning I will read um, our call to worship from um, Psalm 74. And actually this call to worship is a lament. And because of what's going on in the world right now, um, as the church, we, we lament together. And so this is Psalm 74. It says a maskil of Asaf, and a maskil is um, a type of song, I think. This is what it says. Oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anchor, anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have remembered to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own signs for signs. They were like those who swing axes in a forest of trees and all its carved wood. They broke down with hatchets and hammers. They set your sanctuary on fire. They profaned the dwelling place of your name, bringing it to the ground. They said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. And they burned all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet and there is none among us who knows how long. How long, O oh God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand, take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them? Yet, our God, God our King is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of the Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open springs and brooks. You dried up ever flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, O Yahweh, how the enemy scoffs and a foolish people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beasts. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have regard for the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all the day. Do not forget the clamor of your foes the uproar of those who rise against you, which goes up continually. And then the very next Psalm, it says this, we give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants it is I who keep steady its pillars. And then a little bit later it says, I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. I'm going to turn us this way for a moment. It's important as the church to lament um, when the world is suffering, and that's what we join and doing this morning. Let's pray together. The polarization and the racism that is happening in our world in this moment. May we, your church, be people of peace as you were Jesus. Teach us your ways 
Yours are the ways of justice, of equity, of dignity for all people, of stewarding creation. God, fill us with your spirit and we, may we be characterized by humility and surrender to you. God, we join with the world in, in its suffering and in its mourning this morning. And we recognize that not all is well. God, would you be with those who suffer, those who are suffering with illness, with the effects of the pandemic, whatever they are? Would you be with those who are standing up for justice, for those who are on the front lines, helping those who are dealing with this pandemic, with the effects of the virus? And God, in the places that we are today, in our homes, most of us, probably most of us not suffering acutely, would you turn our hearts to what your spirit is doing and saying to us, what you are calling from us? We thank you for your word and we ask that you will meet us with it and in it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On March 1st, we started a series on Jesus through Peter's eyes. So this is mostly for us stonehousers because we were together and we weren't online yet. I'm off quite regularly on the Wi-Fi here. Oops, here. Sorry about that if it was bothering you. I'll start again. On March 1st, we started a series on Jesus through Peter's eyes. It was the first Sunday of Lent and it was time to encounter Jesus face to face. In the text, um, we had spent seven weeks in Deuteronomy and it, it was time to see Jesus again. And so just two weeks after that, we were meeting online for the first time and we were all reeling and searching for footing amidst the upheaval of our normal and the vulnerability of not knowing what was coming. And it's been 12 weeks. And here we are still online, still navigating these uncharted waters, but we're settling in. And the new normal for right now is on board this ship in open water and we're kind of like looking for land. And I was thinking about this and I thought, here are two certain things. We are still the church gathered. And this is an incredible gift made possible by technology. And we have welcomed so many people into our midst to worship um, with us around the word and table in this time when we've been able to be online. So we thank you for coming and joining us. Um, we're so glad that you've joined us and we hope that in time, some of you might join us in person and experience Stonehouse in community and live worship. We'll get there. Our sermon series morphed as a result of the pandemic, but really we've stuck with Jesus this entire time from March 1st until now. We've been in the Gospels, and these are the testimonies of those who were with him when he was on earth. These stories of Jesus have taken us through Lent and Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday, and the Easter season, um, the 50 days after the resurrection. And today, we've arrived at the last day of the Easter season, or Monday, or Pen yeah, it's Pentecost, yep. Yeah. Um, we've arrived at, this is the last day of the Easter season, and today is Pentecost Sunday, when the whole church uh, remembers the day that Jesus sent the Spirit, the Helper, to his disciples as he promised. These past four weeks we have spent in John 14 to 17, and these were Jesus' last words that he spoke to the disciples before he went back to the Father, and then the prayer that he prayed over them just before he was betrayed. And today, on our last Sunday, with Jesus' famous last words, 
we're going to circle back to Peter. So we started there at the very beginning of Lent, and today we're going to come back to Peter, to his last recorded conversation with Jesus. And it's coming from John 21. So the plan is to encounter Jesus through Pe or encounter Jesus through Peter's eyes once again. Before we do that, though, um, if you have a device with you, so this might be tricky if you are watching on your device, um, but I'm going to invite you to take to open up your web browser and to look at a map. So if you have a device with you, open your web browser. That's anybody that has one, even in the room here. Um, sorry, I didn't prep you. I didn't prep you ahead of time. Um, actually, I have a map here if you ladies want to look. We have some people in the room with us today. Um, this is map one. So um, go to uh, esv.org. That's all you have to look up. ES, or you can, in your web browser, you can type in ESV maps. Sorry, this is kind of disorganized. Type in ESV Maps into your web browser, and it's going to take you to, um, I think there's like 12 or 14 different maps. If you look at map one, it says the Middle East today, and I just want you to note the location of the Mediterranean Sea and Israel, and you'll see a little dot that says Jerusalem there. So just note that, first of all. And then I invite you to scroll to map 11. So again, this is um, if you would type in ESV maps in your web browser, you'll look at map one first, and then you'll look at map 11. And it says Palestine under Roman rule. And again, I invite you to locate the Mediterranean Sea and then Locate the Dead Sea. It's kind of a longer um, lake kind of thing. And the Jordan River goes up from the Dead Sea to a rounder lake, and that's the Sea of Galilee. If you look, at the, if you look to the west of the northern tip of the Dead Sea, you're going to see Jerusalem, a little dot. And about 70 miles north of Jerusalem, you'll see the city of Nazareth. And then if you look at the top of the, the northernmost part of the Sea of Galilee, you're going to see Bethsaida and Capernaum. So just take a look at those things. And the reason I, I'm inviting you to do this, this is geography, right? Why are we doing geography in church? Um, this is going to come up a few times today. Location matters. So to see these places on a map reminds us that these stories and these events are embedded in the particularity of time and place and culture and context. And the people that lived at the time when these maps were current um, are people that are not so very different from us. They were in the middle of a topography, right? And they were in the midst of climate, a certain kind of climate. And there's a political context. They were in their communities and in their families. And we as humans have a lot more in common than not. And the more that we can grasp that these texts are located, I think the better we can connect to the text. And we can recognize how astounding it is that at a certain time, God came as one of us. So as you're looking at this map, you can keep looking at it if you want. Sometimes it's nice to have something to look at. Um, recognize that these are the places that Jesus was. And as you look at the Sea of Galilee and Bethsaida and Capernaum, remember that this was Jesus' home base during his ministry. And it's actually the place where he and Peter met. So before we move into our stories, let's reacquaint ourselves with Peter. His name was Simon. Jesus gave him the name Peter, which means rock. 
Peter's dad's name was John, his brother's name was Andrew, and Peter and Andrew became two of Jesus' closest companions for the three years that Jesus was doing his ministry. Peter was married, and he was from Bethsaida, which means house of the fishermen. He was a commercial fisherman by trade, and he was partners with his brother, and they were partners with two other brothers and their dad, Zebedee and James and John. And these men fished the Sea of Galilee with huge nets at night. The Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake in the world, and some of the main species of fish um, coming out of it are tilapia and carp and catfish. Carp and catfish are actually in the lake right next to us as well, and they were caught yesterday here by some fishermen in my family. Peter was a Jew. This meant that he knew the Hebrew scriptures and he went to synagogue. Um, he, was a, he was a tradesman, which meant that he wasn't in the inner religious circle. He was a common Jew, a regular person, just like us. And from what we see in the gospels, he spoke his mind and he wore his heart on his sleeve and he was somewhat head, headstrong, and he took action. Likely, he was trying his best to make an honest living, and he was dealing with the ups and downs of commercial fishing, and he was likely trying to be a good Jew and to live faithfully, and trying to be a good husband and a good neighbor. We don't know exactly where Peter was at and what his longings were and what he prayed for and what his inner dialogue was, what he thought about when he sat in his boat in the middle of the night, what him and the guys talked about, what he talked about at the dinner table. But imagine he was like us. He was located in his life. We don't know exactly when Peter encountered Jesus for the first time. The Gospel of John says Andrew introduced them. Luke places Jesus at Peter's mother-in-law's um, when Jesus healed the whole town. And, and then this all happens before Jesus calls him to follow him. There's a good chance that Peter was at the synagogue in Capernaum the same day that Jesus called the, when Jesus called the demon out of the man. And maybe he was the one who invited Jesus to come over after and heal his mother-in-law. Luke says that when Jesus got to Simon's house, they appealed to him on her behalf. They, Peter might have been one of them. Jesus healed her and then all the sick in their community came over to his house and Jesus laid his hands on all of them and healed them too. I'm guessing Peter was there and was observing all of this. And then Peter had to go to work. And so I'm going to start reading. Um, this is a story from the beginning of Luke, Luke 5, and it'll tie in to our story today, so I wanted to read it. Luke 5, starting in verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they'd done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching humans, people. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Jesus chose Peter and he called him, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be catching people. 
In this moment, there's this invitation to follow him. There's a call and a redefining and a new vocation and a call to trust him. And Peter does. He leaves his boats and his nets on the shore and follows him and then witnesses Jesus' life for the next three years as one of his closest companions. Peter was always in the room. This was discipleship training at its finest. He joined this group of followers and he, they were watching the master at work and listening to his teaching and then being linked to his mission and then beginning to participate and learn as they were doing, as they were practicing. The Gospels attest to a few times when only Peter, James, and John got to accompany Jesus. One time when he raised a little girl from the dead, and another time when Jesus talked with Moses and Elijah up on a mountain. But there were also all of these other times when Jesus would spend all day in the hills of Galilee or in a village healing people and casting out demons and teaching them about the Father and about living out God's ways in the land. The disciples were there. There were those times when he healed the man born blind and the bleeding woman and the invalid at the pool of Bethesda and the paralytic and the Syrophoenician woman's daughter from a distance and the time that he raised Lazarus from the dead. And then there were those times when they handed Jesus a few fish and some bread and he multiplied them so much that this massive crowd had enough to eat and there was enough left over for them to eat too. And then there were those times in the boat during storms. And specifically that one time when Peter walked on the water to Jesus and Jesus rescued him when he began to sink. And then there's all these unre unrecorded times together. These things aren't written, but they're implied. Countless miles walked together Nights out under the stars, conversations, listening to him teach, helping one another. There were these times at home in Capernaum, meals eaten, inside jokes probably, misunderstandings, and grace extended. This was the relationship that Jesus had with these disciples, that he had with Peter. Peter was the one to declare, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God, when Jesus asked who they thought he was. And Jesus responds with, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. And then just moments later, it looks like in the text, when Jesus is telling his disciples that he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders and be killed, Peter responds by taking him aside and rebuking him. Never, Lord, that will never happen to you. And Jesus responds in that moment with, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter was the one to adamantly declare, even if they all fall away, I'll never fall away. I'll never abandon you. And in that moment, Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Jesus knew Peter. He knew him better than he knew himself. And Peter was as human as we come. Three times while Jesus was on trial and getting beaten in the house of the high priest, Peter was asked if he knew him. And he denied it every time. He was standing by a charcoal fire in the courtyard of the high priest. And he denied that he knew his closest friend when he was literally in his darkest hour. And then the rooster crowed, the text says. And one of the gospels says that Jesus turned and looked at Peter exactly at that moment when the rooster crowed. Peter discovered his incapacity to follow and it says he left weeping. And Peter is absent from the rest of the crucifixion story. He must have witnessed it from a distance. We're looking at Peter's life here. 
we're looking at his story as he walked with Jesus, as he went through all of these things, and, and we're going somewhere with it. So, so stick with me. Um, have you ever taken the time to sit with Peter in that space between his denial and the resurrection? If you have ever sat in the unresolved space of a close relationship with a rupture where you've hurt the one you love and you're in the time between that moment of pain inflicted and the restoration of that relationship, you've at least tasted that. That space is intensely uncomfortable and frustrating and it's full of shame and disequilibrium and you desperately want to make it right. But for Peter, between the denial and the resurrection that was impossible, Jesus was dead. Now imagine hearing from your friend Mary that Jesus' body wasn't in the tomb anymore. The text says Peter ran to discover it for himself. Imagine hearing a little later that he was alive and that he'd shown himself to her and that he'd talked to her. Imagine that surge of hope that you'd get, that maybe you'd get to see him too. Maybe you'd get a chance to say, I'm sorry. John tells us that Jesus shows up in a locked room in Jerusalem twice, a week apart, and he reveals to his disciples that he's alive. But we don't get this moment of reconciliation between Peter and Jesus. It's not recorded um, in those times. And so it remains, in John at least, an unresolved space. And then John tells this story, and it's brilliant, the way that this story ties to Luke's account um, of the time that Jesus calls Peter to follow him. Um, I'm going to start reading um, from John 21, 1. And uh, I invite you to follow along with me if you have your Bibles with you. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. This is the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Back on the shores of Galilee, back to what was familiar and comfortable 
and yet everything was different. And there was still this unresolved space for Peter. They had seen the risen Jesus, but only twice. And from the sounds of it, you get this sense that they're sort of floundering. Like, what's, what now? The author seems to be pointing to the unresolved space. All of them, except for the disciple, the beloved disciple, had abandoned him in his dark, darkest hour. The beloved disciple was the only one standing at the foot of the cross as Jesus died. Peter had gone so far as to deny that he knew him. The guys don't catch a thing all night. And suddenly this voice calls out in the earliest morning light, children, do you have any fish? And throw your nets on the other side. And they do, and they have this huge catch. And it's so reminiscent of the first time when he called them. That story I had read earlier. Peter's response to the beloved disciples, it's the Lord, testifies to his desperation to see and talk to Jesus again. I think it speaks to the unresolved space, potentially to lingering shame and his longing for reconciliation. He gets to land and he sees the charcoal fire and it's so reminiscent of the scene of his denial that I'm sure it stopped him in his tracks. In that moment, Jesus commands him to go and help his brothers bring some of the fish they'd caught, and Peter obeys. And then they all eat the food that Jesus gives them, the bread and the fish. And there's enough for everyone. So reminiscent of the feeding of the multitude and the enough left over to feed the disciples. This is the grace of our Lord Jesus. He gives second chances. He reminds us gently. Remember, he gets our humanness. He gets our limits and our frailty and our propensity to forget and to stumble and to turn away. We've seen that over and over in the past 12 weeks, most recently in John 14 to 17. It's why he gave us words like, and promises and truth. I won't leave you, I, I'm with you, stay connected to me, live in my love. And as you live there, you'll bear fruit and the helper is coming. We're gonna move on and start reading in verse 15. Uh, when Jesus, or when they had finished breakfast, Jesus invites Peter to go for a walk. Um, the text begs us to put ourselves in that moment. And um, the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by grassy hills from the looks of it. I've only seen pictures. I um, look forward to the day, hopefully someday, when I can see it in person. Somebody said um, recently who had been there, the shores of Galilee and the Sea of Galilee, it's timeless. Um, you get this sense of, of standing there with Jesus, with the disciples. So anyway, I invite you to picture either these grassy hills overlooking the lake or maybe a stretch of beach and Peter and Jesus walking slowly as I read this. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of John, do you love me more than these? It's not clear what the these are in this. Was it the, the people, the other people there? Um, was it his vocation, his past vocation? We're not sure. Do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, take care of my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. After saying this, he said to him, follow me. These moments, this walk, this conversation, this is the restoration Peter's been longing for. It's the resolving of that unresolved space. And this is his second calling. The three questions, do you love me, mirror Peter's three denials. The whole time they've been together, he has been in this process of learning to follow Jesus. And he's finally, in his denial, discovered his incapacity to do it in his own strength. So the third time when Jesus asks him, do you love me, he's hurt. And when he says, yes, Lord, you know everything, you know that I love you. It's like he's saying, you know me, Jesus. You know everything about me, including my limits. And Jesus responds with, then this is what I'm calling you to do, feed my sheep. When you were young, you did just what you wanted to do. But as you age, as you get older and mature, someone else will guide you where you don't want to go. And you will love just like me. As long as you thought you were strong, you couldn't fully surrender. Keep following me, Jesus says. Jesus will guide him. Thank God for the testimony of these humans, people just like us. The Gospels are really honest. They don't idealize Peter and the other disciples. They, the testifiers and the writers, aren't shy about showing how human these people were. And I think we can find comfort in this. The Bible itself, in so many ways, makes room for us to not have it all figured out. To be people in process, disciples in process. Through Jesus' disciples in the text, we can know God's grace for us. Friends, we don't have to get it right all the time. Getting it right isn't a prerequisite to being his follower. Learning to follow Jesus is a process. And there is no expectation that we're going to do this perfectly. There is so much room for us to be who we are in the midst of our stories and be the people of God, be Jesus' disciples. We're called, each one of us, to follow, to keep following, to turn back when we've turned away from him and gone our own way, to keep making our home with him, to keep listening to keep paying attention, to keep staying connected to his community of followers, to keep staying connected to him, to keep choosing to love. Peter and the other disciples show us that being a follower of Jesus is learning to surrender, learning to trust him, learning to follow him. So I invite you in this moment to think back to the moment when you were called. The first time, the second time maybe. Think back to a moment when you experienced the call of Jesus to follow. How did you respond? If you haven't heard him call before, hear this. Get up. He's calling you. If you've responded once and have turned away or forgotten or you've grown apathetic or passive, hear this, get up, he's calling you, just as he called Peter. 
He's calling you to be with him and to be part of his community and to watch him at work and know him. He's calling you to join him in revealing who God is and in living out God's ways in the land. He's calling each of us to love ourselves and to love others and to love him. This is an invitation. We are located. Just like Peter and the disciples were, we're located in the places that we are in this time in history. We're located in our families, in our communities. We're located in the state of the world, in a pandemic at the moment, in a world suffering from violence that is stemming from racial injustice, in a world that is suffering from overconsumption, so many, so many things and places that were located. I'm going to end with this. Um, a bit of a response to what is happening just south of the border these days. Martin Luther King Jr. preached his last sermon on April 3rd, 1968. He was, I think, shot the next day and killed. Martin Luther King Jr. was located and he was advocating for God's ways in the land and pursuing fair treatment and equality and dignity for our fellow humans. And these are some excerpts from this sermon. And I think it gives kind of a picture of the practical side of following our Lord and loving as Jesus loved. This is what he says. Let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. One day a man came to Jesus and he wanted to raise some questions about some vital matters in life. At points, he wanted to trick Jesus and show him that he knew a little more than Jesus knew and through this throw him off base. Now that question could have easily ended up in a philosophical and theological debate But Jesus immediately pulled that question from midair and placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. And he talked about a certain man who fell among thieves. You remember that a Levite and a priest passed by on the other side. They didn't stop to help him. And finally, a man of another race came by. He got down from his beast and decided not to be compassionate by proxy but with him administered first aid and helped the man in need. Jesus ended up saying this was the good man because he had the capacity to protect the eye into the thou, project, sorry, the eye into the thou and to be concerned about his brother. Now, you know, we use our imagination a great deal to try to determine why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. But I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me, Dr. King says. It's possible that these men were afraid. You see, Jericho, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the Bloody Pass. And you know, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible that they felt like the man on the ground was merely faking and he was acting like he had been robbed in order to and hurt in order to seize them over there, lure them over for a quick and easy seizure. And so the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop and help this man, what will happen to me? But then the good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, What will happen to him? And so in closing, to echo Dr. King, but with a universal call to do and be followers wherever we are located, I'll close with this. Let us rise up, church, with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination 
and let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make the world what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make the world better in the places that we are right now. And this is what it means to be a follower. And again, we don't have to get it perfect. We don't have to get it right all the time. What the disciples are teaching us is that as we turn back, as we re-enter and re-engage um, in conversation with Jesus, as we go to him, that's the first step. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful. We are so grateful to be alive, to have another day, to make it right, to try again, to love, to reconcile with one another, to reconcile with you. Lord Jesus, let us know your mercy in light of our failure, that your mercy extends um, and covers all of our sin, extends over it. Help us extend forgiveness as you have forgiven us. Help us to love one another as you have loved us. Let us relish in being embodied and embedded in time and place and culture and community and our relationships. Train us as your followers, Jesus. Help us to know in the location that we are what that looks like for each one of us. May we come to you, may we hear from you, may we observe who you are, what you are doing, and then participate with you in that. Towards the goodness, towards justice, towards love. Amen. We're gonna to move to communion. And uh, if you have your bread and your wine or your juice, uh, I invite you to get that out. And we'll start with this. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Come to this sacred table because you're hungry. Come not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of God's mercy and God's help. Come to seek God's presence and pray for the Spirit. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. 
I invite you to repeat after me out loud. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's pray. O oh Lord of all, we offer our praise and thanksgiving to you, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this juice in memory of your sacrifice for our sakes. Gracious God, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit on these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of the new covenant. Through your body and your blood, unite us through his body and his blood, unite us to your son in his death and resurrection making us righteous through him and sanctifying us by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things under Christ and bring us to that heavenly feast where with all your saints, we will be gathered in glory everlasting through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, this is food for the journey to which God has called us. Let our lives be nourished by the Lord himself as we come together at this table. So come to this table of grace. If you are with others, I invite you to offer the bread or serve each other, um, the bread and the juice, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ. Just take a piece and eat. Yeah. The body of Christ. Thank you. We all for each other. The body of Christ. Thank you. You can serve me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go up to the house. Thank you. Thank you. wrong <coughs> excuse me here's our charge for today this is written by Peter it's coming from first Peter <coughs> Dexter too <coughs> excuse me Peter writes this <coughs> are you okay bud okay mm -hmm. He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Don't repay evil for evil or insult for insult, but instead, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days... Let them keep their tongue from evil and their lips from dis speaking deceit. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them look for peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on those who do the right thing and his ears are open to their prayer. And with that, I encourage you to go in peace to love and serve the Lord and one another. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat>